I'm so happy to see you all here. I hope this sounds OK. I can't really hear anything other than myself. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read directly from the book. I have five, set, five short sections that I'll go through that I think are in chronological order. Although, um, as I say in the book and as the recent reviews have pointed out, it, it's not true to a chronological order. It's to some degree a spatial order, a geographical order. But I think I, the five sections I picked are in chronological order. And, um, they, they, they kind of dance around a little bit, but then I'll leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A because often, I think always what you have to say or ask is always way more interesting than what I could offer on my own. So um, I'll, I'll get there very soon. And these are just, you know, somewhat out of context excerpts. As we walked, we rarely spoke. The idea of walking down the street wearing headphones and listening to music was strange to us. We couldn't afford such blissful wandering where we lived. We were constantly scanning the streets for certain cars or listening for certain sounds, acutely attuned to our surroundings. It seems like everyone I've seen arrested, beaten, or killed over the years has been caught slipping, unaware of danger until it was too late. Post-traumatic stress was good for one thing, at least. It kept us on our toes. Tols and I were the most prolific of our crew, which had about 12 members at the time. Tols was notably good looking, even to a bunch of teenage guys who were reluctant to acknowledge such things. He also got teased for not looking Mexican, as did Arrest, who was Mexican, but got teased for looking Armenian. Years later, all the guys in our crew learned that Tols was actually Peruvian. We didn't really know what that meant, but we made fun of him for it. <laughs> Tols also got teased for the small black mole on the inside corner of his left, of his left eye. We called it his chocolatillo, Spanish for his little chocolate. We were best friends, spending every day together from the moment we met in another friend's driveway. When we met, he asked me what I was. I knew he meant what was my race or ethnicity, or maybe more generally where I was born, but I wasn't offended. It was an honest question. My mom speaks Spanish, but she's Italian. Oh, he said, so you're not like really white, right? Yeah, I said, and it never came up again. I was always from here, which meant American, but my uncles, the guys standing in front of their lowriders and sporting pompadours and pictures from the 1970s that hung on my maternal grandmother's wall, told me I was a true Latino, which meant not white, but definitely not black, as they would say. I was not white when it kept me from getting jumped, but I was sometimes sort of white. Sometimes I was Chicano by way of a wanting and wayward father, but mostly I was Italian which allowed me to distinguish myself from other kinds of whiteness, yet still included that historical otherness that comprised my mother's side of the family, part Jewish, North African, by way of Sicily. No one ever made fun of me because I was too ambiguous for any good jokes or stereotypes. I had green eyes and black hair with olive skin and a muscular build. I was whatever anyone wanted me to be, but first and foremost, I was a graffiti writer. Aside from when we were ripping on each other, race didn't come up that often. Sure, we were aware of racism as a vague concept, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it was our identity as writers that dominated our every conversation and our worldview. If anything, it was white people who had a race, whereas the rest of us identified by what we did and how we lived our lives. When vigilantes chased us, it was because we were writers. When guys from MS beat us down or pulled guns on us, it was because we were writers. When people crossed the street to avoid us, it was because we were writers. When teachers kicked us out of their classrooms or clerks followed us down the alleys of their convenience stores, it was because we were writers. Even when cops threw us on the hoods of their cars to search us after jaywalking or during minor traffic stops, crushing our fingers and breathing their hot breath and insults into our faces, we thought it was because we were writers. We arrived at the freeway underpass with its large white walls and support columns, which would be our last spot for the night before we entered the projects to sleep on Tulsa's bedroom floor. It was the early morning hours of Mother's Day, so if any day would be considered safe in terms of avoiding members of the Pacas Trece gang when we left Tulsa's unit the next morning, this was it. Even the most hardcore gang members observed holidays celebrating saints and mothers. Even though Tulsa lived in the projects, we all considered him rich. He had lived in the same place with its cinder block walls and smooth concrete floors for the several years that we knew him. His mother had a car and his older brother who lived in a small house in nearby Arlita even owned an aluminum dinghy with a tiny outboard motor which he towed behind his pickup truck to the nearby Hanson Dam on the 4th of July. 
In our circles, consistency meant wealth. Toll, Ceres, Smoke, and I were on the same side of the street when we started to pass under the freeway. We had to shake our cans of paint in our jackets and sweatshirts to make sure the ball rattling inside didn't reverberate through the dead-end street and attract anyone's attention, especially because anyone still wandering around at this hour was likely amped up on speed and carrying a gun. Just as we were about to spread out to hit the large walls with tags, a cop car crept up the street and slowly passed us. We each stood motionless, as if it were movement that would draw a cop's attention to the four teenagers holding cans of spray paint and standing in a dimly lit underpass at 3 a.m. on Mother's Day in Pacoima. The car continued on for another 50 yards and then spun around. The driver hit the lights and the engine made that gut-wrenching sound of acceleration. The four of us ran to the other side of the underpass and up the off-ramp into the bushes that grew alongside of the freeway. Just breathe, I said to a rest. We'll just wait a second until they're gone and then we'll go to Tulsa's, we're fine. I put my hand on his shoulder and the squad car came speeding up the off ramp in reverse with the loud high pitched whir replacing the low drone of acceleration. We all took off running across the freeway lanes. Running across freeways was, was not new to us. We usually did it to ride on the concrete pillars or divider walls separating the two sides of traffic. We also crossed freeways on foot during chases. No gangster or cop in his right mind would continue to pursue us. It always worked. But that night, just before I reached the center divider, I saw light streak across my eyes and heard a loud thud as a car sent me flying into the air. I twisted out of control, landed back down on the concrete. When the moment of chaos stopped, I was face down on the freeway. A raised reflective lane divider was in my face and everything was silent and still. As I exhaled, the acrid dust of the ground puffed away from my face. I watched both the car that hit me and the police car that had been chasing us drive off. The can of blue Krylon that was still in my waistband had exploded, and the cold, noxious paint was mixing with the warm blood pouring from my head and out of my mouth. I couldn't move, even when I saw another set of headlights approaching in the distance. At that hour, there were few cars on the freeway, but those that were on the road traveled fast. The driver of the car that hit me likely did not see me before colliding with my body. Who would expect someone to be crossing a freeway on foot at that time or any time? I still think about that driver and how scared and panicked they must have been to keep driving, never knowing if the person they hit had lived or died. Only a front end dent, some blood, and an inexplicable splatter of blue paint as evidence anything happened at all. My sense of hearing returned and I could hear the swish of cars in the southbound lanes of traffic and smoke yelling, Cisco's dead, Cisco's dead, as he ran down the still empty northbound side of the freeway. As I lay there thinking I was about to get run over again, proving smoke right in the end, Tolson arrest hopped back over the center divider and picked me up under my arms. They pulled me into the emergency lane, flung me over the concrete barrier and dragged me across the six lanes of traffic on the other side. Only I had seen the police car drive off after I was hit, so fearing we were still being chased, they dragged me down the steep embankment and hid me in a dense bed of flowering succulents. We each lay there on our backs, listening for sirens or voices that never came. Feeling immense pressure and terrible nausea, but little pain, I asked Arrest to remove my shoes. As he pulled off my first shoe, my foot swelled like a cartoon thumb that had just had an anvil dropped on it. I was falling in and out of consciousness, and the paint and blood mixture was obscuring my vision, choking me, and making me feel sick. I noticed that, like my foot, my entire body was blowing up beyond recognition. I didn't think I was going to live. Arrest jumped down to the street from the raised embankment to use a public payphone in a strip mall parking lot next to the freeway. Toll sat with me in his usual silence. We're going to be okay, I said. The police are gone. He put my head on... He put my head on his lap and started crying. A car full of gangsters pulled up on the adjacent side street. One guy got out of the back seat, already holding a gun straight out in front of him. In full stride, he jumped up the short retainer wall, put the gun in my face, and asked, Where are you from? Neither he nor Toll seemed to acknowledge each other. I'm from nowhere, I said, as usual. I just got hit by a car, and the cops are right over there. Pacas trece, puto. He put the gun in his waistband before jumping back down, and the car sped off. I couldn't see Tulsa's face through the paint and blood, but I could feel him still cradling my head. Arrest returned and sat next to me in silence. We didn't tell him what happened. Sometimes later, I can't tell how long, my older brother pulled up with my mother in the passenger seat. Evidently, Arrest hadn't called 911. 
He paged my brother and entered the payphone's callback number. My brother then went to my mother's apartment, which didn't have a phone. My mom was hysterical, yelling from the window of my brother's lowered Volkswagen bug that it was Mother's Day. Why was I doing this to her? My brother was yelling too. He needed to get out of this neighborhood. It was Paca's territory. This is from, uh, both of those were from the first chapter. Now I'm jumping to the fifth chapter. This is from the chapter called Where We Stayed, um, Making a Place for Men. My family usually moved to a different motel, apartment, or rental house about every four to six months, depending on how long it would take to be evicted. But we, but we, have mat but we had managed to stay in the apartment on Laurel Canyon Boulevard where we started TUGK for the better part of a year. In LA, narrower streets are where wealthy people live, as this, and as the streets get wider, neighborhoods get poorer. Laurel Canyon starts in an actual canyon above the Sunset Strip, where it has one tight lane in each direction and is lined with million dollar homes. Down in the valley, it becomes a straight, wide, multi-lane thoroughfare crowded with apartment complexes like mine, advertising first month's free rent, no credit check, and move in now. It was easy to get an apartment in one of these places. The complexes with dozens, sometimes hundreds of units with popcorn textured ceiling, wall-to-wall -wall beige carpeting, electric range ovens and paper thin walls overlooking expansive concrete courtyards, tiny fenced off pools and high security parking lots were usually run by rental agencies eager to fill vacancies. The smaller complexes, those with around a dozen units, were also easy to move into since they were usually run by resident managers who were less likely to do a credit check if you had cash in hand and promised to pay the rent on time and not destroy the place. The duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes on streets like Laurel Canyon were older and usually had more character. Arched doorways, thick adobe style walls covered in stucco, Spanish style roofs, and heavy wooden doors with wrought iron door knockers, like the apartment building in Three's Company. But just as in the television show, these places usually only housed white people, elderly white people in particular. In the large complexes, women were the ones who, paid, who, who rented the apartments. Women leased the cars and women cashed the paychecks and state checks to buy the food. Utilities were in women's names and women enrolled the kids in school, picked them up from juvie and did the laundry. And women and women, and women took in the men who turned apartment buildings and sometimes whole streets and neighborhoods upside down. When these men first arrived, they would lie low and act like visitors so they wouldn't get their girlfriends or moms or sisters evicted. But soon enough, they'd be kicking it in front of the building with the rest of us. The men who came through these apartment complexes were always coming from some desperate situation, from other cities and states where they had warrants or had done jail time or from living with girlfriends who couldn't take it anymore, mothers who finally had enough of caring for their adult sons or had died, or sometimes sisters whose new boyfriends, husbands, or grown sons wouldn't tolerate another man in the house. Women's apartments acted like de facto halfway houses between jail and the street. For men in these circumstances, living with other men is too risky for legal reasons. Other men in their circles often have a pending case or also on probation or parole. But men also keep other men in check. When guys get together, one of them is likely to tell the other to keep it cool because he doesn't want to get busted for some stupid stuff. Most people imagine that men incite other men to commit crimes. In fact, a man is, is most likely to get caught up and taken in during a domestic dispute, fighting with girlfriends, siblings, or mothers, with the drama spilling out into the street and becoming a public affair. Even theft or battery can be tied to relationships with women. Often theft is about getting money to fulfill a promise to help with rent, and battery is about fighting other men over claims to a particular woman, her apartment, her car, or her financial support. A common, refrain, a common refrain in the neighborhoods I lived in where I don't cuss, but I write cuss words, so I'll just, I won't cuss. Um, a common refrain in the neighborhoods I lived in was, uh, B words cause problems. But in truth, women economically and emotionally sustain the men who then get caught up in drama and blame the women who support them. Women and children also pay the costs associated with male imprisonment at every stage. When a man is arrested, potential financial support is lost. When he is inside, he may demand that money be put on his books. When he is released, he may cause the woman in his life to be evicted or force her to break ties with the support systems she may have developed and maintained in his absence. And this... Uh, this is from now the, the next chapter, Left Behind. And um, 
this section, uh, for example, um, one of the images that's scrolling um, is, is the image of the place I'm talking about here. Um, it'll come up. The Bally High. When my family was homeless or on the run, we usually stayed at theme motels that didn't ask for identification. The Polynesian-inspired Bally High or Mexican Pueblo-themed El Cortez in Van Nuys, the Tiki-themed Safari Inn in Burbank, or the Spanish mission-style El Patio Inn in Studio City. We would pull up under the covered carport, and my mom would walk through the lobby door and into the tiny reception area, which typically smelled of mildew, cigarettes, and food, and was filled with the sound of daytime television or the local light nightly news. The exotic theme stopped at the sign outside. The rectangular rooms were all about the same. Small bathrooms and with blackened grout in the shower and rust stains beneath the faucets, stained short pile wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and peeling laminate dresser with a TV on top. A small wood veneer table in the corner with one or two filthy upholstered swivel chairs, an end table, a cigarette burn clock radio, and one or two full-size beds with polyester bedspreads. Nicer rooms also had a hutch and a vinyl-covered ice bucket. These motels were well known for prostitution and movie filming. At both the Safari Inn and the El Patio Inn, we had to keep our curtains shut during the filming of two movies, each of which, each, each of which coincidentally involved Patricia Arquette. Quentin Tarantino's True Romance was filmed at the Safari Inn during one of our stays, and David Lynch's Lost Highway was filmed at El Patio Inn a few years later. But when the film crews left, the motels went back to being havens for prostitution, drug dealing, unwitting German tourists, single men, and old ladies who sat around all day and smoked. Sometimes there were other families like ours, but my mom never let us talk to them. If they're staying here, she would say, they must be trash. We stayed at the Bally, the Bally High off and on for years. In the early years, my stepfather would take us there when he was out of jail and in violation of parole. My mother and I, and sometimes my little brother, would wait for him to get back from a job. He would tear into the room with one or two suitcases filled with jewelry, collectible coins and stamps, new and antique guns and baseball cards. He always went for stuff that the local fence would buy without question. My brother and I loved to sit on the bed and roll mountains of loose nickels, dimes, and quarters into paper rolls before taking them to the bank where we'd exchange them for cash. Just about every house he burglarized had a stash of money in a piggy bank or a five-gallon water bottle. They were heavy to lug away. Even a half-filled sparklets bottle had hundreds of dollars inside. As part of the fact-checking for this book, which I was rigorous about because of the seemingly outlandish stories I told, um, uh, as part of that fact-checking, I even checked things like that. Is my memory right? Is a half-filled sparklets bottle actually a few hundred dollars? It is. <laughs> My stepfather always burglarized houses during the day. He used to say that he never wanted to scare a sleeping kid or get shot by a homeowner. He also had a way with dogs. If he entered a house when everyone was at work, he could calm any dog and keep it from barking or attacking. He returned from one job with a huge haul. He walked into the room, sweating profusely and gritting his teeth, and asked me to come help him with the groceries from the car. He and my mother constantly spoke in code, even when no one was listening. Still in my boxer shorts and tank top undershirt, I walked to the rear parking lot past the ice and soda vending machines to the car. He grabbed a bulky sweatshirt that was full of stuff and awkward to carry and told me to get the two large leather satchels from the back seat. We walked down the path that went in front of all of the poolside units, each of which had a humming air conditioner sticking too far out into the path. Just as he was about to cross the threshold into, into our room, a gun slipped out of the bundle in his arms, hit the ground, and discharged one bullet up into his leg. He went into the room and fell against the foot of the bed, putting his foot right on top of my balled-up Dickies pants, white t-shirts, and tube socks waiting in a pile to be washed. I watched as the blood started to pour from his wound onto my only clothes in the world. I put the bags on the floor and just stood there not knowing what to do. He was making the worst growling and grunting sounds I've ever heard. This gunshot seemed to affect him even more than when the police shot him in the armpit several years before when we lived in Burbank. A, a reference, I'm making reference to something that happens earlier in the book. My mother came out of the bathroom where, where she spent the majority of her time and started screaming, I should be at home cooking dinner for my family. These kids should be in Little League. They shouldn't have to see this, you mother effer. Look at what you've done to our lives. It was one of the only times I heard her talk this way, acknowledge our situation, or reveal that she was conscious of our predicament. 
He responded by telling her through gritted teeth to wrap a pillowcase around his leg just above the knee to stop the bleeding and to bring some towels soaked in hot water. I tied the makeshift tourn tourniquet as she ran into the bathroom. She returned, telling us to keep it down or the manager would call the police. The bleeding stopped more quickly than I expected and my stepfather scooted up into the bed. My mother cut a small plastic trash can in half and placed it under his leg to elevate it. She must have also given him a shot of heroin because a minute later he was nodding off. I lay next to him on the bed and kept swapping out bloody towels for clean ones, which I soaked with hot water and laid over his leg. The wound, which looked like a small black hole, had swelled shut, but the taut, shiny skin around it looked like it was going to split open under the pressure. His leg turned purple and black, and although it stayed that way for weeks, he was back on his feet within two days. I hid the gun, an old 38 revolver that he took from somebody's nightstand, behind the filter and the air conditioner. After he fell asleep, I gathered all my clothes and put them in the tub to soak. The blood had hardened, and all I could save were the pants and socks. The shirt was too stained. The socks never got white again, but no one would be able to see that. I did the laundry as I always did in those days, by taking a shower, fully dressed in the clothes I wanted to wear. I would use a bar of soap to wash everything, and after, and after rinsing, I'd take everything off and place them on a towel laid on the floor, roll up the towel with the clothes inside, and step on it to get the excess water out. I would then hang the clothes over the back of a chair, and by morning they would be dry. Everything would be stiff from the soap I used, but it would be clean. This uh, next section is from Way Ahead, um, chapter 12. Uh, the chapter is called Can't Be Stopped. The section is called Crossing. Hitting freeway spots became increasingly stressful over the years. The sound of the whooshing cars at night is deafening, and getting onto and back off the freeway leaves you vulnerable. It's impossible to casually walk up to a freeway shoulder and make it look like you're just taking in the sights. Unlike street bombing, where you could look nonchalant between tags, on the freeway you are exposed and out of place whether you're, in the act, whether you're in the act of painting or not. But hitting freeways is also crucial. Most people drive and most people take the freeway, especially in a city like L.A. A tag or throw up on the freeway is sure to be seen by a captive and geographically diverse audience. Before I was hit by the car in Pacoima, I approached running across the freeway to access the center divider in a calculated way. I would watch the traffic to get a sense of the flow, note the intervals of traffic clusters, and sometimes wait to see a passing highway patrol car so I knew another one would not be coming for a long time. Once I noted the rhythms of the freeway on a particular night, I would take off. Like a surfer breaking into a paddle to catch a wave after reading the ocean swells, it was a frantic yet controlled pace toward a big payoff. Fear was canceled out by adrenaline. But after getting hit, I was ne never able to find the rhythm again. I couldn't read the road as I had been able to before, and the car lights all formed long, blurry trails of white and red. Even when I did find the rhythm of the road, cars arriving in clusters every 12 to 15 seconds with an occasional errant 18-wheeler arriving like a rogue wave to crush the calm, my legs would go weak and I, I would have to sit down. I couldn't force myself to run. Horrid, vivid images, bursts of light, and the sound of crunching bone and metal would fill my head. I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to lift my arms, let alone move my feet. I became overly analytical as I sat there. I tried to determine the traffic's rate of speed and how long it would take a speeding outlier traveling at a modest 90 miles per hour to close in on me as I moved across the first, second, third, and fourth lanes of traffic. 48, 48 feet of running from inside shoulder to outside shoulder. I could run the 40-yard dash in about 11 seconds. I knew this, but being timed in the flat, grassy football field is different from running across a convex surface with its patina of motor oil, cracked concrete, and small pieces of debris punctuated by raised reflectors. How long would it take to get to the other side? Maybe five seconds to cross? In that amount of time, the speeding car would cover 660 feet of ground. Too much thinking was paralyzing. Every time I attempted to cross the freeway, I was delayed by longer periods of such calculating and thoughtful waiting. As it took longer and longer to cross, I realized my days of running the lanes of traffic were over. But although I had lost the will to run, I had not lost the will to paint. So I became more strategic in my spot selection. I would note high profile walls as I drove the freeway by day, then return by night to scope out the front of the building, whose back wall I would hit. Rather than approaching walls from the freeway side, I would access spots from the adjoining street or alley, sometimes climbing over barriers, running across storage areas, and even through abandoned buildings that stood between me and my destination. 
bombing became more like breaking and entering. But even scaling a two-story building by shinning up a drain pipe, climbing over a razor wire top fence, or kicking in a stairwell door to reach the roof of a building that had been gutted by a fire felt far safer than playing fro Frogger on the freeway below. And here is the final section I will read. And um, obviously I skip from chapter five to chapter 12. So a lot of stuff happens in there. <laughs> all that happens, all kinds of stuff. And also in real life, um, from getting hit on the freeway to that feeling of not being able to cross the freeway is several years. Um, and this is in the epilogue and uh, this section is getting out. <clears throat> I'm still a graffiti writer. While I do not actively go out on all night, on all night bombing missions, I still see the, the city as a, as a writer does. I almost instinctively look for ways to access rooftops, calculate how many cans of paint it would take to cover a particular wall, and crane my neck in traffic to look at the backs of freeway signs. I survey fire hydrants, I scan the circumference of light poles, and I always keep one eye on, on, a, on a passing cop car. And although I'm no longer active, I maintain my bomber status. <clears throat> Once a writer has been recognized as, an all, as all city, they maintain that distinction well into retirement. I started college as an active bomber. I would attend classes by day and spend my nights on the streets as I had for the decade before I went to school. The only time I felt completely safe was when I was on a rooftop or in a classroom, so I was able to excel in both spaces. I enrolled in college precisely for that feeling of safety and reprieve. The constant chaos of living in violent situations had the effect of driving me away from its sources. I was repulsed by the brutality of gang members and police officers, disgusted by my mother's drug use and intolerant of the daily social drama that kept people like my brothers, sister, and friends trapped in despair, anger, and fear. I had an aversion to conflict and disorder. Just as writing graffiti provided me with structure and attainable goals, so eventually did being a student. The first time I considered college to be anything more than a place rich kids go to become doctors, lawyers, and football players, I was walking down the street past a community college campus with my writing partner and best friend, Lyric. We wanted to cut through the quad to get to the train tracks on Woodman Avenue at Oxnard Avenue, where we would spend the day painting. When we emerged from between the classroom bungalows abutting the parking lot on Burbank Boulevard, what I saw was unreal. People were sitting in groups on a great lawn. Some were playing frisbee, and some were even sleeping, undisturbed, with books laid open over their eyes. The scene reminded me of one of those brightly colored Jehovah's Witness brochures, depicting children of every race sharing tropical fruits in a meadow where lions and deer frolic together. Lyric and I felt out of place, but not unwelcome. I felt safe on that campus, and with the ball of the uni paint marker rattling in my pocket and a can of spray paint tucked in my waistband of my cut-off dicky pants, it would be a few years before I'd return to this place and enroll as a student. But knowing it was there shifted my orientation. I started looking at college campus campuses differently. While walking through LA on bombing missions, I made a point of walking onto college campuses, USC, UCLA, Cal State LA, and Northridge, and any one of the 10 community colleges that dot the city. That was the, that the world inside the campus perimeter differed so greatly from the world outside its walls attuned me to the fact that different spaces, no matter how proximate, can contain vastly different realities and opportunities. Thank you. And um, now uh, it's, I have no idea of the time, but I, I know I'm fine. Um, uh, there's so much more to talk about and I almost feel like I'm, I'm thinking about my own book in different ways because reviews have been coming out, Los Angeles Review of Books and Times Higher Education, academic journals, and they're all telling me different stories about my book. And I think some of the reviews are actually better than my book. So I feel like I'm watching really good trailers so I don't have to watch the movie. But these really good trailers of my book, um, it's nice to see that people get what I was trying to do, and that is really pull back and let the reader fill the space between their eyes and the page. As an academic, you know, I so badly want to, want to give people context and theorize for them and, and tell them how to think about a particular phenomenon. But um, 
in the editing process, my goal was really to pull all of that out, really pull back and let and trust that the reader will connect so many dots and that the reader will connect the dots in a way that feels personal to them and they'll, therefore they'll feel connected to the text. And along the way, because they're not feeling like they're being hit over the head with how to think, that they'll actually see things in more context, which is ultimately what I want out of them. So, um, um, you know, I, I let them be themselves, which is kind of crafty of me. Um, I, I, I knew what I was trying to do but I wasn't sure it would be successful. So right now, the book's only been out for a few months, but as the reviews come out, it's so nice to see that the reviewers get that. When, um, when I finished with the book, I remember telling my partner, you know, I don't, I don't care if people are negative. If the reviews come out and they're really, I don't care. But now that the reviews are so good, I actually do care. <laughs> I'm sure I would have cared because I care that they're good. So if I get this excited they're good, I probably would have been a little upset that they were bad. I just, I don't know. But um, so any questions you have, maybe I'll be able to reflect on the book like you through the review process. So um, any questions? Let's talk. And by the way, any question goes from the nuances of graffiti to what the book is about 95% of the time. That is actually not graffiti. The graffiti is the glue that holds these situations together. So feel free to ask whatever you want. I'll just get things going. Thank you. The, 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 those readings were wonderful. And I do want to ask you at some point to cure to tell us what these okay. different pictures are. Yeah, I will. But first, um, that you lived, have lived in two such different worlds, and your last reading kind of brought them together a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I'd love, most of us haven't, have, are used to one of them, but the other world is completely foreign to us. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'd like to know is how you don't feel completely schizophrenic mm -hmm. as you think about your life, how it comes together. Mm -hmm. It seems that you, you draw nourishment Mm -hmm. from both, but mm -hmm. tell us about these two different worlds and, and how they make one person without splitting you apart. Yeah, uh, what, what's funny is, I mean, it, it's so true of you to pick up on that. When I first went to college, I, I was a transfer student, so I went to community college first because I actually got kicked out of high school. Uh, the dean or the assistant principal, Casey Brown, he said, don't come back until your, um, your parents come in for a meeting. I was like, yeah, that's never, ever. My father was dead and my mother was Past, you know, ODing on the couch, so I never went back to school. So I started community college um, after I turned 18 because you didn't have to have an equivalency, a GED. I'm still literally a high school dropout. So I started community college, but it wasn't until I transferred up to UC Santa Cruz that I had ever been around, I mean, just to put it bluntly, that this is not a bad or a good thing, I'd never been around so many young white people before. <laughs> and I, I remember being in these dorm rooms and all these young white people would sit around and as we all do and talk about their childhoods and they would talk about oh yeah i'm from you know i'm from the suburbs of san jose and oh i'm from uh, the suburbs of la and usually suburbs and um, they would talk about their lives and it would come out in these subtle and sometimes explicit ways that yeah my dad was not not around too much and i don't think my mom really respects me and i was lonely a lot and there was nothing to do in my neighborhood and as the stories would mount I was crushed by the pain that these people suffered. And it was, it was scarier to me than my own upbringing that was so full of abject and objective violence that these stories of feeling unloved or not having eye contact or feeling alienated or feeling pressured to be something by someone else scared the hell out of me. And, and I didn't pity these people, but I thought they have as hard a life as I do. And, um, and their pain is relative to them, and my pain is relative to me. And maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm able to deal with it better because I'm, I, I'm always confronted with society being amazed and outraged over my upbringing. So at least it's in dialogue where their upbringing is like this silent misery that just, that just exists and hovers over so many communities. So I, I, I always felt lucky. I always felt like my story at least is a story. Theirs is too, but no one feels like telling it. So, um, I, I, and that, that perspective of growing up in the way I did, I, I always feel like it's always contributed to, to what I've tried to accomplish or do. So there, there was no real, there's no break between then and now. It's just, you know, subtle transitions.
Yeah. And um, Stefano, the photos? All right. Um, this is uh, me painting one of my giant letters. Very, there's, there's like one picture of graffiti in the book. This is a version of one of them by my friend Christian Guzman, who would go out with a night lens. Um, there's no captions in the book, so I'm giving you captions. Yeah. This is the apartment that was raided in 19, on New Year's Eve of, of 1996, uh, which I elaborate on in the book. And also a recent New York Times op-ed starts with a little anecdote about that. This is the welfare office that I write about in the book, waiting in line for 15 hours. My mother was undocumented, so she always had to be on emergency relief after the Clinton, after the Clinton administration transitioned into a new welfare program. So I tell a lot of stories about being in that place. This is Bally High. This is the, the entryway that we would park in, that we got chased from, as I talk about in the book. And I'm actually going to come back to this that very picture in just a second. Uh, this is the back of Valley High where my stepfather would park and he'd say, you know, come help me get the groceries. And he would speak in code, but he would always uh, kind of air quote with his voice, uh, come help me get the groceries. <laughs> Either say groceries or don't say groceries. No one's here. Um, and this is one of the literally dozens and dozens of rentals, houses, apartments, trucks, hotels, SROs that I lived in my entire life up until I went to college, and the first bed I ever owned was my bed in my dorm room at UC Santa Cruz. I remember coming into my dorm room. I'd never in my life owned a bed. I'd slept on mattresses, but I never, that, it was my bed. I remember getting into bed, and I was laying there, and, um, and I put on my favorite album of all time, because I was like, this is a moment for me, even though I didn't say it out loud. So I lay there, and I turned on uh, uh, No Need to Argue by the Cranberries. Uh, I'm, uh, so I put on the cranberries, and I was laying there. I was like, this is, I made it. This is the greatest moment of my life. And my roommate, Sam, sits up and gets his head, his giant headphones, and he throws them right at me. He goes, plug in the damn headphones. I'm trying to sleep. I was like, this is the greatest moment of my life. So I, I used his headphones for the next year. Um, um, Sam is actually now a faculty member at USC, and we reconnected. And he's like, he's like are you still listening to the cranberries? Like, of course. Uh, but this image is interesting because, you know, I, I write about so many moments in the book that would appear to be so painful and traumatic and, and beyond belief. And I acknowledge that. And they are. And even to the reader, I could see, you know, the, the anguish that is associated with reading this. But in writing about those objective moments of trauma, I felt really nothing. I, I've built up, for good or for bad, I've built up this callus or what might also be associated with a degree of PTSD. So I actually don't see, I don't realize how traumatic things are. I know it intellectually, but I don't feel it emotionally. But um, there were times when I was writing this book, the first probably 30% of which I wrote on this campus, the rest I wrote in a coffee shop in Tucson when I, when I went there for a professorship. I was sitting at a coffee shop and I'm just writing along, you know, really you know, horrendous moments, never gratuitously, but writing about them in all truth. And I was writing and then every moment of writing, I wanted to be rigorous with fact checking. You know, I'm, I, I published this book with a publisher who had previously published a book that many people picked apart for not being completely true to the facts. Uh, for, for, for right or for wrong, this book was really exposed in all of the media for being less than accurate. Um, and I didn't, I, I, I refuse to let that happen to me, both because I don't want to be inaccurate, but also because I care about validity, especially when you're dealing with something that's so over the top, it seems. So as part of that fact checking, I thought about writing about that Bally High section, part of which I read to you. And I, I wanted to make, I, you always have to, to fact check your own memory. So, I, well, I remember it being Bally High on Sepulveda Boulevard. Was it Bally High on Sepulveda Boulevard? So I looked, I, I used the Google machine, you know, Bally High, Sepulveda Boulevard Hotel, just to make sure I got the spelling right, I got the address right, fact checking my memory. And I'm sitting there and Google Street View popped up and there was that picture. And I, I'd been, I was fine all day. I started crying so hard, but I was in public, so I, you know, I, I held it in. And I went outside. I was trying so hard to, to repress the cries that my stomach was wrenching, the pain. And it, it, that happened throughout the entire writing of the book, where I would, I would cry so hard over things that no reader would rightfully 
think is a painful moment. And something about the visuals or just those small moments that in the book I, I go over pretty quickly because I wrote the book, I write the book in a way that the reader could go quickly. Um, those were the most painful moments. Not the, not the moments that, that <coughs> rightfully so, some people may find painful to themselves. It wasn't to me as much. So that's why I'm letting these pictures run. There's no uh, captions in the book uh, purposefully. I didn't feel like telling such a contextualized and emotional story and make you look at images that also had captions telling you a contextualized story. I let the images speak for themselves. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for being here. I took your class freshman year. Oh, yeah? It's like my all-time favorite class at Brown, so thanks, appreciate thanks. it. Um, so two, th two questions. First of all, what are your relationships like with the people from your upbringing today, how that's evolved over the years? And then also, I mean, any, I mean, what do you think made you different in terms of how you were able to kind of make it out, I guess, mm -hmm. or have this, this new life as opposed to some people that are still, that are still there? Mm -hmm. I'll start at the second question and go back. I think what helped me get out of that you know, vulnerable situation was a combination of being a giant egomaniac and a giant coward. And what I mean by that is I was so obsessed with the non-material aspects of having fame, just being recognized for going all city, that I was, I was driven by something that made me no money. It didn't buy me clothes. It didn't get me rims for a car I didn't have. It, none of that mattered to me. All that mattered was that people saw my name. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it, uh, egomaniac to a degree that is so human, but oddly enough, rare when people go after material possessions, combined with being a coward. And what I mean by that is, I, 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 I never wanted to confront someone who wanted to confront me. I never wanted to be in a social situation that I thought would get me punched in the face, because getting punched in the face is terrible. It's the worst thing that could happen to you. So I was always running from conflict. I'm still conflict averse. Running from conflict, but running toward the conflict associated with trying to get my name painted on a freeway bridge. So the combination of those two things saved me. And, and other people, you know, metaphorically, but also literally got out, but um, they had other paths. Mine were those kind of just personality, I don't know if you want to call them flaws <laughs> or characters, but those first personality characters, you know, got me out. And um, uh, as far as where the, where the people are, you know, writing an autoethnography, there's so many ethics involved in, in, in feeling that you're privy to other people's story. And... Um, I, you know, I, I tried my best to contact people whose story I was telling, even though I was changing names and really not elaborating on much more I could have elaborated on. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure that people were okay with these stories. And, you know, when you come from a background like mine, as many people in this room, I'm sure, can understand, it's hard to find people. You know, networks crumble daily. The social capital that so many people rely on through their whole lives just isn't there in the same way for people where I'm from. So where they live and who they know and the schools they go to and the jobs they keep just dissipate moment after moment. So you can't find people. Um, so I, I ended up, I actually got an Instagram account which is super fancy because I've never owned a cell phone. I still don't. So my partner showed me how to get an Instagram account on her iPad. And through Instagram, people from my past had been contacting me. And what's, I don't know if this is funny or tragic, but some of the people that I write about in this book, um, they haven't read it yet. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's interesting because I know the desires there, but we come from a space and a, and a, and a, and a situation where literacy in all of its forms, access as well as the skill you might say, just isn't there as it is for the communities that many of us are in now. So a lot of a lot of the people from my past have, you know, contacted me, you know, how can I get your book? Where could I get your book? You know, um, will Amazon send it to me? Like really not understanding the, you know, the the circuit of book acquisition. So it's a completely different culture and subculture of non-readers. So um, um, I, I need to get the book into their hands at some point, I guess. Other people, like my older brother, um, I, was, I was pretty worried about what he would think because he also lived part of these stories, even though we were always separated. He would, we'd come back together. 
And at a recent reading in LA, he was there and he was very, very approving of, of you know, thank you for telling a story that otherwise is overly romanticized in some media or criminalized in some sectors. He's like, so thank you for just, you know, as he says, keeping it real. And um, so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been good, yeah. Um, making sure you can hear me. So when growing up in um, an environment of chaos and discord, um, we often look to the bare minimum points of survival mm -hmm. um, and structure or stability. And it seems as though you found a lot of stability within writing, mm -hmm. um, whether that's seen as productive or unproductive to some people. Mm -hmm. um, I'll let people decide that for themselves. Yeah. But if you were have if you have not chosen that path of writing, um, do you think where do you think you would be today? Do you think you would adopt some of the coping skills maybe like your mother had or people around you have taken? Um, I'm just curious if you've mm -hmm. ever thought about what your life would look like if you didn't seek out stability in the form of writing. Yeah, I, I, before graffiti came along, I think I was just like looking for that stability, some kind of glue, and it was always just weird stuff. I, I remember when I was, I, I must, however old you are in sixth grade, I remember deciding one day, and this is a form of rebellion, but I was rebelling against a different, you know, uh, lifestyle than most people rebel from, but we all still rebel. So I was rebelling from the drugs and the chaos and the, fight, the constant yelling and television and just, it was always a, just cacophony, always. And I remember leaving my house and walking to the supermarket and stealing a head of iceberg lettuce. And I came home and I locked myself in the bathroom because I didn't want to be shamed. And I ate the whole head of iceberg lettuce. <laughs> I, remember, I still I remember just eating the iceberg because I was convinced it would make me healthy. And, and I've always been very healthy. I've never had a beer, I've never had a sip of beer in my life. Not that that's unhealthy or bad, I just haven't. So I think I would have become obsessively healthy eating heads of iceberg lettuce, and because I saw that in myself, you know, almost like almost like a, an addictive personality or a character issue in, in an odd way, and and so, but I realized that eating heads of iceberg lettuce, you know, wasn't going to last that long, so. Um, I saw other other things in me like that. I remember deciding, um, in addition to being the healthiest person on my block, I would be what I now know is called a graphic designer. Um, I only know that term because of Derek. Um, I always admired, you know, fonts and styles. So I enrolled in seventh or eighth grade um, in Mr. Mendez's graphic design class. I was like, I'm going to be the greatest graphic designer of all time. And I started. I don't know the process, but I started, you know, with an X-Acto knife, you know, cutting letters out of this blue film, and then you, like, lay the blue film on or something, and then, like, it takes a picture, and there's, like, a shadow, and then you make a bunch, you put it in this press, and you cut them, and I'm like, that's it. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to eat lettuce and be a graphic designer. <laughs> and it was actually in Mr. Mendez's graphic design class that all of these young graffiti writers um, you know, said, wow, you're really good at cutting out those letters that you created. And you have a nickname, because I was talking about this nickname I had. And, um, you know, it wasn't really like this, but you should write that on every wall in the city. <laughs> and um, so it was in Mr. Mendez's class that I became a graffiti writer. And as I tell the story in the book, how I actually started actually, you know, illegally, you know, uh, uh, as, as an act of vandalism, write that name on city property. Um, so, yeah, I would have been, I don't know, a different version of ridiculous. <laughs> Hi. Hi, thank you Hi. for sharing. Um, so, as a Latina who comes from the neighborhoods that you describe, and as I'm seeing you here, I feel like I'm seeing a white man appropriate and describing, like, the culture. However, I know these are truthfully your experiences, um, and you mentioned a lot of things within your book. But I'm wondering about how your white passing identity has influenced your life, and if it's something you think about complexly, and just how um, that has shaped you. Yeah. Um, no, that that it's always a thought I have. As far as appropriating, zero possibility of that. I've bled and sweat and done too much to be appropriating anything other than reality. Um, I'm appropriating my own reality through the written word. So there's no appropriating of anyone else's experience at all, period. Impossible. As far as identity and privilege, that's an issue I'm always thinking about. And as I, as I started with, you know, being able to say that I'm not Chicano or being able to say that I am white or I'm Italian, which is a different version of right, white, 
or being all these things got me out of different situations. So I think I talk about this in the book, but I'm not sure. You know, um, being at the Panorama Mall when a guy was going to stab me for being white, I was able to say, no, 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 I'm not white and not get stabbed. When I was getting jumped by MS or 18th Street or Radford Street, I was able to say, no, I kick it with North Hollywood boys. I'm actually a Chicano like you. And that spared me a little bit. Uh, when the police would come down, is a story I do tell, the police, the last thing you want to be, this is going to be contrary to a lot of, you know, valid narratives, but the last thing you want to be is the one white guy in a group of guys when the cops come. And the reason for that is because, especially in those times, and times have changed a lot, uh, just for quick context, the year I, grad or the year I would have graduated from high school, there were over a thousand homicides just in the city of Los Angeles that had 3.5 million people. Now there are over 4 million people in the city of Los Angeles, and the, hom the number of homicides hasn't, hasn't gone over 300 in over a decade. So my 90s is very different than anyone's experience in the past 20 years in terms of violence. And in those 90s, the Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums Gang Task Force, and just cops in general, far less diverse police force, they would come upon a group of guys, and I was the most white and white passing person of the group always. I always have been anywhere I lived. And if there was ever another whiter person, and sometimes there was, like this guy who wrote Merge, who I write about, um, the cops would descend on him. And part of it was, to put it bluntly, cops were racist. And cops would look at the one white guy as they would actually articulate the race traitor. What are you doing with these knuckleheads, they would say to the white kid. What are you doing with these gangsters? What are you, as, if, as if he was a race traitor for being with these other people without seeing the white kid as part of these people, this group of graffiti writers who identified as graffiti writers. So cops the expression of their racism would usually be about cracking down harder on the white guy through sheer force, but then still more likely to arrest the non-white guys. So it was this, it was different how different forms of violence manifested, whether they crushed your knuckles or whether they took you to jail sometimes did depend on race. But um, as I said, in, when I first started reading, we, we would tell racial jokes, but we were writers first. And um, race was always there, but we were too uninformed, naive, and really ignorant about, about structural racism to really think about it on a daily basis. For us, race was this thing that white people were obsessed with. We were obsessed with bombing. And that's how it played out year after year after year. For good or for bad, that's just how it played out. And um, we really didn't know what a Peruvian was. When we found out Tulsa was Peruvian, we're like, oh, what? You know, we all talked about being a Peruvian. It was, it was so amazing to us. It was, it, uh, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. I just had some quick questions. So mm -hmm. firstly, like you mentioned that graffiti holds the book together in a way. Yeah. So I was just wondering, like, how does the role of place come into being as well or how is it is it a narrative thing that mm -hmm. comes up or how have you approached that mm -hmm. and secondly um, it's an autoethnography and you've definitely talked about your own experiences but mm -hmm. how did you choose to leave out some if you left some oh yeah, yeah. Uh, how i chose to leave out certain yeah, stories certain or stories, perspectives yeah because obviously yeah. You, you had like we could see that you have certain you know, inputs, and I'm sure you might have left some things as well. So how did you choose? Yeah. I mean, yeah. There were times where I was writing where I left out certain traumatic events or situations or larger structural perspectives because I was, I was making myself tired. I, was like, I can't include everything. It's just it's going gonna, it's gonna to be overwhelming. I have to pick and choose so that there is somewhat of a, well, not somewhat, a, a narrative through line. Even though it's not in chronological order, I have to keep this same consistent pace. And if I put everything in there, I'm, just, I, I'm gonna divert from that path because there's so, so much to say. So really it was, it was, a, it was a structure issue, it was a writing issue. Um, it was also to some degree an emotional issue. You know, there were certain things I don't say in the book that I just, I can't get to. It's just, there's too much there. Or there were situations that I'm, I wasn't sure I could rigorously fact check my own memory or ethically rely on a story that involved other people that I felt comfortable in writing about. So all of those conspired to force me or allow me to leave certain things out. Um, 
you know, the, uh, autoethnography is, is, is not autobiography. Autobiography is writing about one's life as oneself. Autoethnography, if you break down the word, it's writing about culture as mediated through the self. So this is an autoethnography where I'm talking about a, a, a social and spatial context through my own perception and my own engagement with it. That doesn't mean just because it's me speaking that I'm entitled to or correct of, uh, in terms of everything I say, but I own it and it is mine. I, I possess it and I, I lived it and I developed it. Um, and if that, if I came, if I came up against someone else's reality or story, I would stop there. Um, as far as graffiti holding it together, you know, I, I, I've never been so interested in the headlines or the neat stereotypical categorization of what a graffiti writer is. You know, the images of the typical graffiti writer or the narrative about graffiti being, you know, hip hop art or who does graffiti. Because unless you're a graffiti writer, you, you are as, as subject to those stereotypes and narratives as everyone else. And that is your wrong. Like every culture, especially subculture, but every culture, there's so many nuances and inconsistencies, it's impossible to paint what a graffiti writer is or easily tell what a graffiti writer is. A graffiti writer is someone who writes graffiti, and that diversity is all through our community. So graffiti has always been something that was the glue in my life. It kept me attached to people who I was always moving away from, but always found a way to find them again. Like in the book, talking about people writing their pager number on the freeway so I could find them. The graffiti really was the glue, and I never needed to tell the story of, you know, the origins of hip-hop graffiti in West Coast, because that doesn't exist. There are no origins of hip-hop graffiti in, on the West Coast. West Coast graffiti comes from, comes from you know, the placas of the 1940s, and before that, it comes from the glyphs of, of you know, a, a century before that. There's no starting moment. Um, so, so graffiti is, is the glue, it's the background, and it's what I continuously return to in the book, but it's always, you know, in between is always writing about all of the other issues that people in my community and people still in those spatial but also social communities are still dealing with all the time. My getting out by going to college doesn't mean poof, the thing it disappears. It's a, it's a hard reality. Times have changed. Things are less violent. You know, police are still brutal, but don't have those same, uh, those same you know, anti-graffiti task forces in the way they used to. They just call them something different now, which is my, my, my recent op-ed in the New York Times talks about that, how to put gang members into gang databases using superficial identity markers. But graffiti is always the thing that was placed over my head, but I refuse to ever place over my head. It's just the thing that I did and that I dedicated myself to. So yeah, it's glue, it's a through line. It's also on the cover because, um, is it on the? Oh yeah, it is. Ellie's graffiti subculture. It's it, it, it's on the cover. And it, it, oddly enough, my publisher is wonderful. My editors are wonderful. We fought over nothing. The only thing that I even tried to challenge them on was that subtitle. It's like I don't know if I want the word graffiti on the cover. Is this about graffiti or is this about a reality? Uh, is this about poverty? Is this about violence? But graffiti really does hold it together. It's the glue. And even the word subculture. Was I part of a subculture or was I just part of a culture? We're a culture of people. We're not sub anything. But again, you know, having people pull it off the shelves relies on words they know, not my unpacking of words. Yeah. Um, I have a high step. Oh, oh, yeah, so I've been with the mic. Uh, so uh, amazing uh, reading. Uh, uh, I have two questions, uh, one slightly more academic than the other one. So. Yeah. Please feel free, whichever one you want to approach Great. first. So first, I was when you were saying uh, fact-checking, so I was wondering if there was something uh, which you found uh, to be, you know, your memory was very different from what oh, you yeah. actually, when you fact-checked, and it's like, wow, really, it was like that, or, you know, it was more or less, or mm -hmm. how memory, I want to know how memory plays, going through the experience, you know, transforms a way of coping with it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or, or uh, suppressing it, uh, if you have an example of something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is, I'm just amazed by the way you describe, you know, uh, what would be considered very mundane urban spaces, you know, just the, cr the act of crossing or the freeway, right? I mean, it's just not only how it means something very different f from one's perspective, both li literal and social, if you're going down the freeway 90 miles an hour in a car, you know, it's 
a completely different space when you're running across it, uh, you know, uh, being chased by cops. Mm -hmm. So, but there's they remain separate. So, is there? Did you find? And city, I find the way you're describing it is this this contradictory, you know, milieu in a sense, which is both overlapping yet keeps people separate. The mm -hmm. concrete hitting your face on it means something else well, when your you know, tires are rolling on it. Yeah. So is there smell of it? When most of us haven't uh, smelled you know, accurate smell of concrete mixed mm -hmm. with paint and blood. Mm -hmm. So, but is there any space or any, any urban spaces that you can think of where those you know, worlds which are separate or remain separate come together, mm -hmm. where you felt that, hey, you know, this is surprising that I wasn't expecting that here you can sort of see to the other side or can mm -hmm. feel feel that the other experience in some way. Yeah, those are both great questions. Um, I will do the, 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 the first one first. The first one is, um, you know, my mother, I, I don't know how much this comes through in the book. As one reviewer said, this book is not about graffiti. It's about actually about my relationship with my mother. And I trust that reviewer. It really is. And, you know, not from a Freudian perspective or anything. It just, it, it's about my mother. It's about my relationship with my mother. And I don't know if it comes through in the book, but she was so interesting. She was this, you know, this quintessential 1960s Hollywood street kid after being a 1950s Barrio Logan Chola. She went from being a chola to a hippie, but as she would put it, a tough hippie that didn't put up with this peace stuff. She would always say that. And I mean, you know, like, you know, you know, stories of spitting in cops' faces and her whole life. She was so interesting. And she would, she, I don't think she ever went 12 hours in my life without talking about Janis Joplin. She was always talking about Janis Joplin, but she was just a really kooky, interesting person. But she also told a lot of stories about why we were in the situation we were in. You know, when we were living in an SRO with Tacho, you know, why are we here? Oh, it's because, it was always because somebody did this thing that led to this thing that led to this thing. That's why we're here. It was always this Rube Goldberg of unfortunate circumstances, and that's why we're homeless. So growing up, I was always like, wow, everything is a true conspiracy. Everyone's out to get us. So while I was working on the book and just working in my own life, I was always trying to, to connect the dots of how all of these people were always conspiring to make my life so hard. You know, I enjoyed my life a lot. I really did. But they were always conspiring. And as doing the research, I, I, I feel bad actually doing this, but I, I was fact-checking my mother's stories. You know, we weren't kicked off of welfare my whole life because she was undocumented. She, we were not able to get what's called TAMF, T-A-N-F, after um, AFDC, um, welfare benefits after 1996. It's true because she was undocumented, we couldn't, but all she had to do was, and I, I looked into this, is file a form at the beginning of every month and her check would be there on the 15th and the following first. Like, like welfare checks always come out on the first and the 15th. And she would have to file this, this piece of paper every month on the first and we'd be good for a month. She never did it. For whatever reason, the trauma that she experienced as a child, the drug addiction, the chaos, whatever it was, whether it's good or bad, she could have filled out that paperwork. It wasn't just because Clinton is out to get us. or the, it, it was because of her largely, but not her fault. It was because as well of her actions. So fact-checking some of those, I actually felt guilty. I felt like I was fact-checking my mom's stories about our predicament. There were other times that are more mundane. You know, when I got hit on the freeway and being dragged down um, and the guys from Pacas that I say, you know, putting a gun in my face. I mean, I return to every scene in this book that I write about because if I say that I ran a, a quarter mile, I measured it because it feels very different to run a quarter mile than to exaggerate and say, oh, I ran from the police for two miles. No, you didn't. No one runs from the police for two miles. It feels like two miles, but in reality, it's about 100 yards. So I would go back, wow, I ran a mile from those cops. No, I ran 340 feet from those cops before jumping into the wash. So I did real measurements. And when I went back to the freeway off ramp, I remember coming down the embankment into the succulents, laying there, the short retainer wall. Well, when I got back there, it's where the five freeway crosses Van Nuys Boulevard and Pacoima, none of that was there. I'm like, I swear this happened. I, I, I'm, I'm positive this happened. Everyone around me knows this happened. So I went to the Department of Building and Safety. And I looked, that entire off-ramp was rerouted to look like it does now in, I think, around 1998. 
So I had to do that type of fact checking because I don't remember the off ramp looking that way. Well, it didn't used to look that way. There's also not a payphone there. <laughs> so yeah. And um, the second part, uh, very, more briefly, because I can go into this forever. You know, I also write you know academic articles in peer reviewed journals that are much more quote unquote scholarly. I just had a piece come out in Progress in Human Geography on the policing of car space, how, how members of vulnerable communities are over-policed at the side of the car, far more than they're over-policed in any other spaces, actually. Um, and so from that academic perspective, I see the freeway as literally what it is. It's something that was funded federally after 1956 that cut through areas that were redlined by the Homeowners Loan Corporation starting in the 1930s. And areas that were, home, um, that were redlined were redlined because they were seen as hazardous in terms of being able to pay back a mortgage a loan. Well, sometimes an area were redlined because the topography wasn't good for development, the housing stock was poor, um, exclusively white communities you know didn't uh, were, were working class so white communities or communities not fit for development were also redlined however not one single predominantly black and they used the term negro back then and that's on the actual form not one a predominantly Negro, black community in the United States, even when the housing stock was good, the topography was good, and people had working class jobs and could pay back their loans, not one of them was anything but redlined. So the story of redlining is that a lot of communities were redlined, but no communities of color were anything other than redlined. And in many of those documents that are now available to everybody, you see these documents, you know, topography, flat, you know, uh, uh, schools, housing, uh, um, you know, small businesses, perspective of the community, all A ratings, ready to get a green ranking, but 90% Negro, therefore redlined. And if you look at freeways that were funded in 1956, they cut through communities that were redlined from a capitalistic and federal government perspective because those are the places with the lowest land values. Those are the places with the lowest land values because your racist assessors determined that people's blackness would be used to not give people loans. You pulled funding out of communities that you then try to argue are objectively the proper path for a freeway. So freeways for me, from that scholarly perspective, are racist scars across America. That's what they are. They divide communities, and the people whose homes were raised to make way for those public infrastructure project, projects are overwhelmingly communities of color and poor communities, including poor white communities. So a freeway for me is everything that has to do with, with urban studies. It, it, it puts the urban and urban sociology, urban geography, urban anthropology, freeways more than anything. But in writing the book, I didn't want to say about everything I just said. In writing the book, I want to talk about a very personal but not unique story of interacting with the freeway. Yeah. Um. Stefano, I see why you have so many dedicated student followers just from this evening alone. <laughs> And I can't wait to read the book, but I want to take you up on your uh, comment at the very beginning where you talked about how wonderful it was to get good reviews. Yeah. So could you say like something about what was the nicest thing yeah. that you learned in a review about your work? Yeah. What was the most challenging thing mm -hmm. that you've learned in a review about your work? And what kind of review would you love to see? Mm -hmm. You know, if everyone who's reviewing your book has, is already connected to graffiti, Mm -hmm. It's like, that's predictable, yeah. right? But who would you like to see review your book beyond the obvious? You mean besides Reese Witherspoon and Oprah Winfrey? Yeah. <laughs> Not Them joking too. at all. Um, uh, I, I mean, the most challenging, I actually don't disagree with, but it was the most challenging. And that came in a review by a sociologist who I don't know, and it's a wonderful review. Like every other reviewer, they get it. It makes me very happy. But he says something that I, I don't disagree with, but it, you know, I, I, I needed to hear it. He says that because I pull back so much in my book, which he acknowledges is purposeful and stylistic and also about intellectual engagement, but the way that I pull back that I'm leaving space between the reader and what I'm saying that could be filled uh, uh, with uh, 
fr with conservative perspectives. So the reviewer even references J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy and says, you know, Block's Going All City is not anything like J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy. It's more like these other works. Well, when you say a book is not like another book, you just put it into conversation with that book. But the thing is, I love J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy because it's so foreign to me. I don't understand what it, what it means to grow up white and poor in Appalachia. So it was a page turner for me. So if readers are going to fill that space I created with reactionary or conservative, whether that means partisan or conservative in whatever way you use that, if they're going to fill that space with a conservative perspective, who am I to tell readers how they should lend their perspective to the books they read? I can't. Um, I'm trying to guide readers, but more so I'm trying to expose readers to realities that they have either seen demonized or overly romanticized, and I'm trying to make it more objective. So that was the one that kind of, I appreciated it, but it kind of made me think. Uh, the one that I like the best is probably um, reviewers, um, a reviewer Jeff Farrell, who's, you know, the greatest writer on graffiti ever. He's a sociologist in Texas who's been writing for decades about graffiti, come up with some of the great terms to contextualize what graffiti is. He wrote a really great review that, um, that focused on the graffiti part, which was actually less interesting to me than the non-graffiti writers, like in the Los Angeles Review of Books, and this is, I'm getting to what made me happy, and that is the reviewer's ability to see past the graffiti, to see past all the headlines, to see past the neat categorization of people, and to see that I'm, I'm giving the writing and therefore the narrative and the intellectual contextualization a light touch. And the light touch, as he puts it, is so needed in academic work, especially academic work that's also available to a wide audience. And, and as he says, that's what makes this book both intellectually engaging, but also a page turner. And when I read that, I was like, are you talking about me? <laughs> so that made me very, very happy. And what I would like to see, uh, I guess I would like to see more people connect, articulating how they read the book and what they got out of it. I don't need to hear them tell me what I taught them. I don't need to hear, hear them tell me, you know, um, what I got wrong. I don't think I got anything. I don't think so. I'd be happy to hear if I got something wrong. But I don't need to hear what I did. I want to hear what they got out of it. I want to hear people connect the book to other completely different circumstances. So I'd be really happy to see this book in conversation with seemingly disparate works. That would make me happy. Yeah. Um, we'll, ha we'll take two more questions. So cool. here and up front. Hey, sure. Hi. Hi. So, um, this actually has to do with what you just said about uh, demonizing and romanticizing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was wondering, uh, you mentioned in the end notes, you talk about maybe the Loca as a movie that's pretty accurate to life in those neighborhoods in the 90s. Yeah, Echo Park, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was wondering if there are any other, this is kind of a three-parter, sure. uh, any other movies you, you like particularly uh, as mm -hmm. portraits of this period? Uh, and is there anything that you particularly notice that movies and pop culture tend to get wrong mm -hmm. uh, about this sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Uh, and the last one is I, I wonder if there's anything that you have always sort of wanted to see in a movie uh, that you feel would be true to life and has just never been depicted that way. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, Mi Vida Loca is a movie from, I think it's 1988, um, which, I mean, it's directed by a white lady not from the neighborhood, but it's so incredibly accurate that the first time I saw it when I was younger, I remember thinking that, that this was some kind of a documentary. I mean, I thought they were using actual, and they did, members of, of Echo Park. And um, it's just so incredibly accurate. No other movie is that accurate, though. It's Mi Vida Loca, and Mi Vida Loca has you know, ridiculous moments and ridiculous caricatures of people, but the majority of it is pretty damn accurate. Just the way it depicts people's day to day walking down the street. So what always interests me in a really good movie or a artistic rendering of some kind of real life situation is how they get the moments of boredom right. I don't, it's not the moments of exaggeration or excitement, it's the moments of boredom that almost no one gets right. And the majority of all of these transgressive, criminalized, violent subcultures is that is the majority of the time we're just as boring as everyone else. Every of the, the worst gangsters I've ever known sit around and play Super Mario Brothers all day. 
and eat sandwiches and raise their kids and go shopping and sleep on the couch. And then moments of violence burst out. But people are not consumed with violence and drive-by shootings and you know chaos all day, every day. It's just a low humming chaos that, that pours through our lives. But the moments of violence are actually a big deal for anyone. We don't get desensitized to it. So no one's really been able to capture those mundane moments so well as in Mi Vida Loca and a movie called uh, American Me which is, you know, it, it, it's, it's a movie, so it's, it's, it's a little overdone, but it's actually a really good story of, of one of the founding members of La Amé, the Mexican Mafia. It does a pretty good job. Every other movie is, for the most part, ridiculous. Um, Blood In, Blood Out is, it's like a Portlandia version of a gang movie. Uh, Colors is good because they use the, the filming locations or my neighborhood. And there's moments that ring true, but for the most part, it's a movie. So I don't mean to criticize the movies. As movies, they're great. As depictions of real life, they're ridiculous because it's almost impossible to depict real life in an accurate way because that would be really, really boring. So to answer your last question, what would I like to see? I would love to see a really, really boring movie. <laughs> a, just a boring how people just move through the spaces of over-policed, criminalized, subject, subjected communities in ways that is almost unbearable to watch because it's so boring. That would be beautiful to watch. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the book. Read it cover to cover in like three days. Oh, so um, I love reading about graffiti history. So I'm going to be the guy that asks a couple of graffiti questions. Great, great, great. I just want to get your take on a couple of phenomena that we're seeing in kind of uh, the current graffiti scene, which would be um, the kind of underground war between street art and graffiti. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also interested to get your take on this um, kind of rise of the anti style movement, which is um, for folks in the room would be like graffiti that is kind of deliberately. Um, crude and ugly, mm -hmm. um, usually coming from artists who are very talented. Mm -hmm. And it's more about performance or where they can put it, and it's kind of the destruction of something beautiful. It's, it's um, so Anyway, I'm just curious to hear your take. Well, I mean, the, the battle between graffiti and street art really, I, I think, at least from my perspective, I could easily be checked on this, but seems to really have come to a head in like the early 2000s. I picked 2004 as kind of a moment that all of a sudden it was, you know, street art was taking up some of those spaces from the graffiti writer's perspective, or that street art was allowing people to romanticize or look fondly upon graffiti. And there was a tension there because of that. Graffiti writers don't want to be accepted. The best way to get rid of graffiti is to tell us we're allowed to do it. I'm not going to bother doing what you're okay with. Like, why, that, that, I'd have no motivation to do that. Um, but... A Shepard Ferry actually said this. He's the creator of the Obeyed Giant Phenomenon, the quintessential street artist. And he's right about this. He says, yeah, street artists are appropriating graffiti images. Companies are appropriating you know, the placas, the font of the graffiti writer. Um, movies and different forms of legitimate media, uh, legitimate media are appropriating the style of the graffiti writer. But you could never, ever appropriate waking up at one in the morning, putting on your backpack full of paint and going out into the city, risking both your life and your freedom to spray paint your name on a freeway wall. You can't harness that. You can't appropriate it. All you could appropriate are the symbolic representations of that. So go for it. You could have it. So take the style, take what it looks like, take what you think it looks like, but you can't take the, sh the practice, which is kind of a transition to your second point that a lot of those, you know, the crude, you know, ugly, I consider it like neck face graffiti, may in fact be a kind of, oh, you want to take our, our art, you want to take our style, you want to take the sophistication of our aesthetic, take it. I'm going to write neck face or whatever name so crudely across the front of a building, you can't harness that, you can't take that aesthetic because that's vandalism, that's aesthetically unpleasing. And for that reason, I love it. I saw a video recently of some guy, it was either in Spain or Italy based on the trains, and they would stand at the station as the train would pull in, they would start, with the, they would hold the can up against the, the train, and they would just go like this as the pain went, and it would leave all these you know, marks, and then when the train would stop, they would just write terrible graffiti all over the train. And the first thing I thought was like, well, that's ridiculous. And then instantly I thought, and therefore awesome. Like, I, like look at you 
right scribbling on a train. That is ridiculous. And we need more people. Take this with a grain of salt, but not really. We need more people not showing up to work, not showing up to church, not showing up to all these things we're supposed to show up to, and instead go and scribble on trains like a bunch of lunatics. That warms my heart. It gives me hope for humanity, is what I was thinking. And it does. So I, I love the anti-aesthetic graffiti. And again, as I actually say this in the book, I was never motivated by by being an aesthetic purist. I was motivated by my ego and by getting up. I produced, you know, what what the review that came out today in Times Higher Education says, I'm a West Coast legend for these certain style I came up with. You know, giant letters that don't close at the top, uh, top to bottom, topless letters that I innovated in the early 90s. And I was known for those. And people consider them art. And they're very hard to do in terms of skill and style. And they're beautiful to look at. But I don't see them as art. I see them as me getting my name up in a very legible way, in a way that will feed my ego and keep me alive. Um, so I've never, not once in the book, do I use the term graffiti artist. I'm not an artist. I don't care who's an artist. Everyone's an artist. There, you're all artists. None of you are artists. It doesn't make a difference to me. It's what you do. It, it's, what, it's the risks you've taken. It's what degree will you go to to do something that makes you no money and that most people will rightfully or not look down upon. That, to me, is human. So I love ugly stuff. People have also asked me, well, what, you're, a, you're a homeowner. You're a professor, and you have kids, and you own homes. And what if somebody... Uh, 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 Thank you for not asking this question. What would, and and, and pe people ask it all the time. What would you do now if somebody came in? They always do this ridiculous motion as, as, if, as if that's what graffiti looks like. What would you do if somebody scribbled on your wall? And I always answer honestly. If somebody scribble, scribbled or wrote on my wall, I would come out in the morning and I'd be honest. I'd say, wow, look at that. While most people probably, you know, between the ages of 16 and 36, however old the graffiti writer is, while most people that age were at home asleep because they had to go to their job in the morning or it's just playing video games all night or doing the things that were expected of them but actually aren't contributing to any great degree for the most part because none of us really are, that person took it upon themselves to go out and write on my wall. What a act of humanity. How interesting. And I would keep thinking that while I was painting it over. <laughs> because that's my wall. You're not allowed to paint on my wall. And when I would paint on other people's wall, paint over it if you don't like it. But, but the idea that my wall is such a sacred space as so as to make me intellectually, you know, uh, 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 um, poo-poo that human act of pure ego and adventure just doesn't make sense to me. I could appreciate things I also don't want to look at. And I, I, I would say I wish everyone would, but no, I don't expect anything out of anyone. If you think graffiti is art, look at it all day long. If you think it's ugly, don't look at it. It's actually vandalism, and I like that. <laughs> yeah.